Welcome back. It's 2.30 p.m. in Athens. You're listening to Radio Bubble. This is the RB News International Show, your weekly show with news from Greece you haven't heard about, brought to you by the Radio Bubble community. I'm Irene Greek. Today, my guest in the studio is Augustin Zenakos, a Greek journalist who works with Onfollow magazine and who runs the Borderline Reports uh, website, which is an English language website with news from Greece. Augustin, welcome to Hello. Radio Bubble. This isn't your first time in the studio since you used to sit in the studio yourself. No, it isn't. I, I used to have a show here for about a year. So, welcome back then. Uh, ah. So, I wanted to talk a little bit with you about alternative media in Greece and how they cover stories that are not covered by the mainstream media, specifically stories that are completely inadequately covered by the mainstream media in Greece and that are more often than not totally ignored uh, mm -hmm. by the media abroad. Uh, I don't know if you saw a few days ago Nikos Mirneos at Smikos on Twitter posted on his blog smirneos.net uh, a description of how events in Skouries, the gold mining story in mm -hmm. northern Greece, are covered through Twitter. And the first reason he said he was interested in that is that it's underreported by mainstream media, mm -hmm. but it's very well covered on social media and alternative media. Okay. Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't see the, the particular uh, post, but in, in general, uh, let's say as an introduction to the, uh, to the conversation, uh, I'd like to say that what we desperately need uh, in Greece is media period. I mean, independent media. I don't know if it's the right thing to do to focus exclusively, exclusively on alternative media, or at least we should be able to define a bit better what we mean by alternative. Because I think that what we mainly mean at the moment is media that covers news independently. Uh, this should be a job for any media in reality. So, uh, at one point I was at a, at a conversation uh, regarding the crisis of the press in Greece and someone asked me whether in Unfollow uh, our magazine we have a different, say, set of rules. Um, and we replied that, no, we don't. We have the rules that should be uh, for everybody. For example, we, we, we cover news independently with no regard to funding or other kinds of interests. The other thing with alternative media is that, we were discussing this also before, is that, okay, for some things, what we call citizen journalism is very, very valuable. For example, if something happens like a demonstration either here or in Skouries, and you have people on the ground, this, after a while, after you observe many posts, many tweets, you will get a pretty objective uh, report of what's going on. But there are other issues. For example, with Skouries, you have the issue of the investment itself, the cost-benefit analysis, things that are also obscured by the mainstream media. Now, it's very hard to have citizens' journalism on issues like that because that requires investigation, which is lengthy, it's costly, and people that are not being paid to do that job in that sense, they are not professional. Although they might be very good, can't do the job adequately. So I'd say that we need a whole host of things. We need, first of all, to... Um, we need more media, call them mainstream, call them whatever. That quality are media? Quality media, yeah. It's a problem of quality. And then, yes, of course, we need that part which... Uh, an observer on the ground will always be a lot better in covering, and we have that to a large extent through social media. In the case of Skouries, you know, I, when I tried to list those media that covered Skouries in an appropriate way, meaning that they did not do propaganda mm -hmm. in favor of the company, essentially, uh, or of the government policy that has to do with it, what I found interesting is that you have some volunteer media, let's call them this way, or semi-volunteer media because people cannot always be paid a regular salary. 
like Radio Bubble, Omnia TV, Unfollow, mm -hmm. um, Borderline Reports, which is your personal initiative. So if you decide to write something on that, you do it, but nobody's going to pay you for doing that. Yeah. And then. Uh, Unfollow is a, is a bit different in that respect. It does pay uh, every single person that writes in it. So it's not exactly volunteer. Oh. But okay. Borderline Reports, yes, is completely yeah. unpaid. And on the other hand, and then you have uh, Ephemerida ton Sindacton, the mm -hmm. editor's newspaper, which is the only truly independent newspaper, formally speaking, in this country, since it is owned by the journalists. Mm -hmm. And then you also have Avi, Left.gr, and Altruthes, which are essentially affiliated with Syriza. That's true. Uh, now, for me, this is... Up to a point, this is an issue, uh, because some of the best media, the most reliable media in this country in terms of the information they will give to you, are not independent. They're actually affiliated with, formally affiliated with a political party. Yeah, but that's, that's also the particular circumstance in which we find ourselves now. We don't know how long this is going to last or what other shapes it is going to take. Um, Syriza is a party that went from having 4% to having 27% of the vote. Uh, it is still um, a party that is in opposition. So to a large extent, it's to its interest to expose the government in every respect. So it's no surprise that you get more objective coverage from its media on issues that expose the government. So in essence, it is politics on their part as well. It just happens to be politics that at the moment, for us, that we see things more objectively, is the, polit the politics we prefer to have. I think we should pass judgment on this when Syriza becomes government, if they ever become the government, and how they handle the media from a position of power. Uh, yes, because especially in the case of uh, Khalkiviki, if you look at some of the citizen media or apparently citizen media available on the ground, there are a few blogs like Anti-Gold Greece, which is run by a group of individuals. And then there is SOS Khalkiviki, which my impression is, is very much led by the Syriza youth uh, in the area. Now, of course, you will tell me the Syriza member of parliament, <coughs> sorry, from uh, Khalkiviki, was elected exactly because she was involved in the struggle against uh, the mining project. That's But true. it will be interesting to see how this evolves yes. after. Um, Absolutely. But with regard to the mainstream media, I think... Uh, This, this, this doesn't just concern Halkiviki and Skurges. It's our general problem. The way that uh, media uh, is funded in this country is really the basis of the problem. Um, even in the case of Skurges, you will see that in the last few weeks there is a huge advertising campaign um, paid by the company, Elas Gold, El Dorado Gold, which is the parent company. It's in every single newspaper, um, big advertisements that cost a lot of money, actually. And uh, it, this, in, in, in Greece, creates a kind of relationship that is very hard to break. Also, the owners of the media sometimes can even be direct stakeholders in different investment projects in the country which, of course, the result will be that there is no meaningful public discussion for the costs and benefits of every investment. Even if one decides that will not, say, treat the environment or anything else as something sacred, there still needs to be an objective discussion on what the costs are and what the benefits are. Even if the logic is that we have to sacrifice something in order to get an investment, we need to know exactly what we're sacrificing and exactly what we're getting out of it. And we don't know that. Because of the coverage of the mainstream media, there is a blurry discussion about some people that support the environment and some people that support the investment without really knowing what the specific arguments for one or the other position are. Uh, to get back to uh, uh, an article by Mariniki Elevizopoulou, which was published first in Greek on, on follow, in Onfollow magazine, I assume that it's going to print 
in the coming edition. Uh, a second part. Uh, the second part is coming, going mm -hmm. to print now. And it's the first part has already been translated in English on borderline reports. Now, uh, what I found interesting when I read it is that there have been a few articles in the foreign media mm -hmm. about what is happening in Khalkiviki. They mostly focused, however, on the environmental aspect of mm -hmm. the damage that would be caused to that region if the project were to move forward. Uh, which was already, I mean, that this appeared in the foreign media was already a success for citizen journalists who are looking into what's happening in that part of Greece because the owner of the gold mine happens also to own a majority share in the main TV channel, a few newspapers, and in many ways yes. to be the Berlusconi of Greece. Um, what I found interesting, though, in Mariniki's article, and what made it really different from anything that I saw published anywhere else, is that she explained in detail the... the corrupt process through which the mining rights found themselves in possession of Bobolas and his company Hellas Gold. That's true. Look, the, the thing is that the, the environmental part, the environmental discussion is very important. But when uh, there was the last decision of the Council of State, which is the High Administrative Court of Greece, um, in that decision, the point that was me being made was that Greece is in crisis. It needs the revenue. It needs money. It needs investment. Therefore, uh, in this emergency situation, it is reasonable to sacrifice a part of the environment in order to have the investment. This was the reasoning. And looking at that from our point of view, from a journalistic point of view, we believe that it is not... It is not enough to stress the environmental consequences. One must look at the terms of the investment itself. So one must show first that this is um, a process that uh, has been uh, going forward without any transparency whatsoever, at a great cost uh, to the detriment, what can, what can say, of na the national interest. They acquired the mines very, very cheaply, this company. It was a company that was uh, founded um, barely a couple of days before this transfer took place and with a capital of just 60,000 euros, which at the time was the lowest uh, a company of that type should have as investment capital in order to be chartered. And uh, then they pretty much transferred the mines from one company to another for a cost of 11 million euro, which is really nothing because the deposits in the area are calculated to be worth close to 40, 14 billion uh, dollars. And then after that, you have uh, a succession of moves by the government, which are really one more scandalous than the other. You get an approval of an environmental study, which is suddenly fast-tracked without really having the legal requirements. For example, there is no plan B presented in case their proposed optimal, op optimal method doesn't work. And then finally, there's the terms of the agreement itself, which are scandalous. For example, according to the Greek mining code, uh, the Greek state will get no mining royalties whatsoever. If you compare that to a country like Romania, for example, they upped their mining royalties to 8%. Uh, in Greece, will get zero out of whatever comes out of the ground. Secondly, it holds no stakes in the company itself, the Greek stake, state. Again, in Romania, it has something close to 30% of the mines. And thirdly, most importantly, they are trying to protect the company and under a, a law that is scandalous in itself. Uh, it's a part of the Greek constitution, Article 107, which is protection of foreign capital. Now, this is absolutely preposterous. Uh, you know, supposedly in a democracy, you protect property no matter who it belongs to. Why you need this specific article that protects foreign investment is absolutely crazy. It's almost colonial in, in, in concept. Now, if they manage 
to use that article, which is quite easy to do. All it needs is a presidential decree. It doesn't have to go through parliament at all. So it's, in addition, thoroughly undemocratic. If they manage to protect the company with this law, then that means that for 10 years you can't touch the operational status of the company, not by law. You need to change the constitution in order to do that. Plus, you lock its taxation at 10% fixed. So all Greece is going to get out of this is 10% tax on the company profits, and that's that. So my point is, sorry for if this ran too long, uh, my point is that even if we accept the argument that we need to sacrifice a part of the environment in order to have a good investment, it's not a good investment. It's a very bad investment for everyone except Eldorado Gold. And Mr. Bobolas. Yes, but Mr. Bobolas, again, his role, should uh, we should be accurate about this, Mr. Bobolas holds 5%. Mr. Bobolas was uh, used for his political connections in Greece. He's the one, obviously, that sorted out all the bureaucratic fuss, and he gets the infrastructure works for his construction company. 95% is Eldorado Gold. They do this all over the planet and they're trying to do it here as well. Yes, but I mean, I agree with what you say. However, well, 5% of a company that is valued currently at 2 billion something is not little in no, the no, first it's place. A lot of money. And the only work that is happening currently is the construction works, mm -hmm. which is actually Mr. Bobol is making money. Sure. El Dorado hasn't made any money on, sure. on work yet. They've been making money on their shares. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's the way that these multinationals operate all over the world, really. You need a local agent that will have connections in the government and can make things happen. And that's why El Dorado Gold only appeared relatively recently. Alas, gold was founded and then it went through a series of changes in its mm -hmm. stakeholders until suddenly Eldorado Gold appear, appeared with 95%. So could you give, before we go for our, our first musical break, could you give us an idea because the article written by Mariniki is very, very comprehensive. I mean, how many months of work go into this type of article for a magazine like Unfollow, which is a magazine with limited resources in many ways? Yeah. And do you think you would be able to publish something similar in another medium than a magazine where that is managed by the journalist who can choose to write a long read uh, whenever they make the choice? This, this is really a choice of designing the editorial. We, you know, we almost made a bet with ourselves, would this work? I mean, would a magazine with really long, exhaustive almost texts uh, interest the public? Uh, it turns out it does. Uh, people buy it, which is why we also have the um, capability of doing these sorts of reports. But the, the trick for us uh, is to have many of these uh, researchers going on at the same time. So each, one, some, each time something breaks, then you write it up and you publish it. That's the only way. Okay, so let's go for a short musical break and we'll be back to talk about another very important story that broke in on follow, which is the fuel smuggling scandal involving Aegean oil and what happened next, which was probably even more interesting than the scandal itself. Welcome back. It's 5 to 3 p.m. in Athens. You're listening to Radio Bubble. This is the RB News International Show. I'm Irene Greek, and with me in the studio is Augustin Zenakos, Auzenakos from Twitter, who is a Greek journalist from Unfollow magazine and who also runs the English language site Borderline Reports. Uh, so we spoke about the way uh, media coverage of events in a place like Skouries in Khalkidiki is inadequate and what media like Unfollow have to offer by the fact that they're independent, by the, uh, the fact that they're using a different format where they can publish long reads uh, without the limitation in the number of words or characters that you would have in a, a regular newspaper. Uh, another interesting uh, report that Unfollow produced recently was a report about fuel smuggling, which involved, again, I mean, the common points of this fuel smuggling story with the Scurie story is that it was published in Unfollow and uh, that both involve 
um, two of the greatest oligarchs, let's say, that we would have in this country. Augustin, could you please describe a little bit what the fuel smuggling story was about in the first place? Sure. It was a report uh, written by Lefteris Karalambopoulos. Um, and uh, the story, in a few words, is that uh, in, in Greece, like in other countries, uh, oil used for shipping is tax-free. Uh, because uh, it is tax-free, it is colored differently uh, in order to be able to tell it apart from oil that has uh, duty on it. And uh, one of the most lucrative, uh, though not so legal, uh, businesses is to um, take the color out of the oil and channel it back into the market at a regular price. Now, this is done in small batches at the time, but they build up and they cost quite a lot of money. Um, we uh, happen to have in our possession two uh, reports by the customs authority that implicated two major companies, oil companies. One was Hellenic Petroleum and the other was Aegean Oil. Now, Hellenic Petroleum and Aegean Oil are different uh, situations uh, because though the big fuss was made about Aegean Oil, I'll just uh, let m limit myself to that for now. Aegean Oil uh, was taken to court, uh, charges of felony smuggling and... Um, What's sorry? What's the word? Plastographia, uh, forgery. Forgery. That's right. Sorry, and um, the trial had been postponed four times already. Um, the um, what you call in district attorneys, the the counselors for the state, didn't even bother to appear in in court, and uh, the whole thing was just buried. Nobody was talking about it. That this major company was accused of smuggling. Now, the founder of the company and uh, the man that essentially runs it, although he's not a member of the board, uh, is called Dimitris Melisanidis. He's a very powerful and very rich businessman who is also poised to buy OPAP. OPAP is something like a national lottery. It is the company that holds the monopoly of, on gambling in Greece. It's controlled by the state. It's got about 30% of the shares. And it's... Uh, part of the fast-track privatization program imposed by the Troika. And uh, Mr. Melisanidis is, uh, let's say, the favorite contender for this uh, privatization. We basically broke that story about the smuggling, which does not involve him personally. He's not personally accused because he's not on the board. His brother, though, is and is personally accused, is charged with a felony. Uh, and Obviously, here you have two sides. You have the company and you have the state, supposedly, because the customs authority is a state authority that is accusing this company of smuggling. It is a bit strange, we were pointing out, uh, when a company is accused of smuggling and when the state itself is basically the one making the accusations, to have the very same state uh, basically building up this very same businessman to buy um, OPAP. This is what we pointed out. That was the story. On the next day, we got a phone call at the office of the magazine. This guy, who identified himself as Dimitris Melisanidis, asked for our reporter and started threatening him, his life, his family, his wife, his kids, basically whatever. It was uh, this phone call that you're mostly used to listening to in Martin Scorsese movies, you know. It, uh, it was strange. Uh, the thing is that our reporter, before he came to Unfollow, and uh, for many, many years, about a decade, was a sports reporter. Mr. Melisanidis was the president of a very popular football club. So he is a public persona, his voice is very well known, and our reporter is perhaps an expert on his voice. And uh, what we also did is, uh, with a very brief search on the internet, we found that the number that he was calling for from was a number from the Aegean's main, main office uh, near the port. So after this, um, we, of course, we talked to our lawyers and everything. We issued a press release uh, saying the whole thing. 
And the next day we got another phone call, this time from Mr. F- Mr. Failos Kranidiotis. Mr. Kranidiotis is a well-known persona in, in Greece. Uh, he's got very, let's say, militant right-wing opinions. He writes articles quite frequently in newspapers like Demokratia, uh, in which, among other, he thinks, uh, he advises that the army should hit the streets in order to maintain order and other nice things. And nice he also recommended that all independent state bodies be shut down a few days ago. Well, there you go. So that's the guy. Uh, and this man is also a longtime friend and unofficial advisor to the Prime Minister, Andonis Samaras. Now, he called us and said that he is attorney for Mr. Melisanidis, and he called uh, to basically deny that his client has ever called us. We published the denial and then went ahead and filed the lawsuit against Mr. Melisanidis for the threats. This is the story. Yes, so could you please, because you've been um, in this, uh, you've been in this crazy situation. I mean, by all, it's not every day that you get Martin Scorsese type phone calls. No, not office, every day, thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when you're, you're in this situation, you're trying to keep your magazine going, you have to go to court, this trial is going to take forever. You told me it's already been postponed twice? Uh, another two times since we published the story, since, yes. Yeah. Now for the sixth time, it was postponed yesterday. Okay, so Mm -hmm. there you go. And this goes on and on and on. Yet, what coverage did you get for your story? We got a bit of coverage in international media. That's true. Um, Al Jazeera published the report and uh, several blogs, of course, as always. Uh, But which report did they publish? The one about the fuel smuggling or the one about about the threats? About the threats. About the threats. Uh, the one about the fuel smuggling was not was not published anywhere, and in Greek uh, mainstream media there was almost total silence, with one notable exception though, which is amusing to to mention, uh, Alpha TV, which is one of the big TV stations, did mention the threats again, uh, but it was a fairly balanced report. It said that uh, it started from our report on oil smuggling and then it talked about the threats. Uh, what has to be pointed out, though, is that Alpha TV is controlled by Dimitris Kondominas. He is a businessman that was a contender for the privatization of a pop and is now the least favored contender the most favorite contender being Mr. Melisanidis. So it stands to reason that his TV station would uh, publish um, the report. But so did you translate the report about oil smuggling Not yet. to English? Not yet. We intend to, but that's the thing, that the translation part is something that Mariniki and myself are doing because we believe it's important to be done. But we have to find time to translate these things. And some of them are not that easy also because there are technical things involved and... You know, you're telling me I'm trying to translate a, a report about tax evasion in Greece that Polyphemus wrote for us. Mm-hmm. It's taken me two months. Yes, <laughs> and I'm not done yet. <laughs> yes, it's not very easy. Um, so, but basically, the only coverage you got for this was in international media in English about and some media in Greece the threat. Yeah, to the threats. They, they, they all covered the threats. Uh, they didn't go uh, to any length uh, as far as the old smuggling bit is concerned. Uh, some newspapers published, again, the threats. Uh, the editor's newspaper, Ephemerida on Syntacton, like you said before. But most of them um, focused on a part that was a subsequent development. Uh, Syriza took this up, uh, particularly the threats, and made an issue out of it in Parliament, in a plenary session. The party representative mentioned it, and the New Democracy, the government uh, representative, uh, replied. Uh, he also said that it's uh, a silly... How did he say it? He said, it's a silly misdemeanor. Why should Parliament be concerned? That was his, his argument. The threats, that is. 
so some newspapers took it up as an issue of conflict between Syriza and the government. Um, and so they branded us as somehow playing Syriza's game. Of course. <laughs> so of course, our, our report had nothing to do with Syriza whatsoever. It was about oil smuggling in relation to a specific company. Uh, you have to understand that in Greece, there are some things that we uh, whisper about but they never get mentioned. Like uh, the name Dimitris Melisanidis in Aegean Oil is only mentioned as a success story. You will find it in socialite coverage, for example, um, how successful he is, uh, what a miracle this Greek businessman who uh, went so high as to supply oil to the American Navy and stories like that. Uh, there have been issues in the past. There was another case of oil smuggling with Aegean in 1995. That was pretty much buried also. Uh, there are things we don't talk about. That's the general idea. One thing that I find interesting in both of the Scurier story, where the oligarch involved is Bobolas, and the Aegean oil story where Melisanidis is involved, is that the competition... Their competitors for these same activities are not trying to expose them. I mean, if you look at media ownership, the most mining-friendly coverage we've had in the big TV channels recently was on Sky Channel, mm -hmm. which is the competitor of Mega TV, where Bobolas has a stake. Uh, in the same way, the Aegean oil story... Mr. Latsis, who owns the other <laughs> refineries, doesn't seem to be really trying to hit the competition, do they? Well, M Mr. Latsis in particular has a stake in Hellenic Petroleum, which was also implicated in the report mm. for charges of smuggling mm. of its own. Mm. So Mr. Latsis wisely perhaps chose not to uh, react to the report. But in general, I understand what you mean, but this is the concept of oligarchy is exactly that it's not competitive. It's not about competition. This is one of the myths of, uh, well, for lack of a better term, capitalism, that supposedly it's all about uh, free market competition. There's nothing free and nothing uh, competitive about a place where you basically use the state, the government and laws to protect a set of people that control large sectors of the economy. This is called monopoly. It's not called competition. And this is the, the basis of uh, an oligarchy is that you divide up what is to be had and then you protect each other's interests and that's what they do very rarely there will be a battle that will be visible for a brief period and then there will be some arrangement and it will just die out and that's how it goes on thank you very much let's go for another short musical break and we'll be back to wrap up this show Welcome back. It's quarter past three in Athens. You're listening to Radio Bubble. This is the RB News International Show. I'm Irene Greek, and I'm sitting in the studio with Augustin Zenakos from Unfollow Magazine and the website Borderline Reports. We were talking about two important stories that involve considerable corruption, <laughs> essentially, um, in Greece and how they are undercovered by the Greek media and why this shows that there is a need for quality media in Greece more generally. Now, in the case of Unfollow, uh, which is the Greek magazine from which you draw material for Borderline Report, can you tell us a little bit about the story of this magazine, how it came to exist? Sure. Um, a lot of us worked in the mainstream media in the past, um, different uh, media, newspapers, radio. Uh, some of us resigned because we couldn't handle it anymore. Uh, others were fired uh, in the crisis. Uh, the media had a big uh, problem uh, with uh, debts that in the past were covered through bank loans, um, rather scandalous again. Uh, when this... Um, facility, let's say, dried up uh, because of the crisis, uh, they started firing 
um, indiscriminately, I was about to say, but not so indiscriminately, really. They started firing mostly their good reporters or the dissenting voices or people that were involved in unions or were more radical. Uh, we spent about a year after we went away from the mainstream media thinking about what to do. And in the end, we decided to do something ourselves. Uh, we faced the issue that I mentioned in the beginning uh, of the show, that in order to do professional journalism, one must be able to make some money out of it. Otherwise, it's impossible. You need to have another job and then do journalism in your spare time, which is not really uh, very productive. So we got together, a few of us, um, three of us mainly, uh, let's say, take care of the more day-to-day uh, -day, uh, work for the magazine. And then there is a wider group that now numbers 30-odd people. Uh, what we said was uh, that we would have no backer, we would have no kind of deal, no loan, nothing. We'd put up some money to basically print an issue. If that brings back enough for us to continue, then we'll continue and ev eventually we'll get paid. If not, then we'll do something else. Everybody accepted this proposition. Thankfully... Uh, the public reacted, and this is without any mainstream advertising, because, of course, there was no money for that. Just the social media, just the internet, nothing like that. Which, again, is a, a strange strategy, if you think about it, because you're using the internet in order to send people to buy something which is printed on paper. But it works. And now, 15 issues down the line, the magazine is managing not only to pay for its own expenses, but to provide a basic salary for the full-time people and pretty good fees for absolutely everybody that writes in the magazine, photographers, etc. So, up to now, it seems to be working. And... It's just a great feeling, let me share that with you, to be able to make a living, if even if that is, uh, let's say, uh, modest, uh, by doing exactly what you want to do, reporting exactly how you think things should be reported, and uh, being able to just discuss this with another 10 or 15 or 20 reporters, whoever comes to the monthly meeting, and that's it. No interest to consider, no advertising deals, nothing. Just reporting. That's great. Uh, one thing that kind of makes me wonder, actually. I mean, the media are in an economic crisis, not only in Greece, but everywhere in the world. I mean, all media outlets in Europe are downsizing. Uh, start from BBC all the way to Radio Bubble. <laughs> so... On the other hand, in Greece, during the crisis, we've had this sort of mushrooming of alternative new media, new forms of media. There's Unfollow, there's the editor's newspaper, but even a, a volunteer endeavor like Omnia TV, for example, does require a minimum amount of investment. I mean, you need to buy equipments. If nothing else, you need to pay for your live streaming. Um, what does it say for you that in Greece, in this crisis, so many people are trying to do something in a sector which they know, because it's like that everywhere in Europe, is not likely to bring much money home? Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, all these things uh, need to be examined sort of specifically it, it, it's not the, the large image let's say if one zooms out and just sees uh, a surge of new media uh, that impression can be misleading first of all as far as mainstream media are concerned they're downsizing everywhere because of the reasons that we've discussed countless times of course there's the competition from the internet etc etc in Greece specifically uh, the situation was a bit different. Uh, the media here, most of the media here, were never, uh, their strength were never their readers. 
uh, it was advertising deals, mainly, uh, bank loans, and uh, all this was secured on the basis of a political game if the specific newspaper or if the specific TV station would basically push or threaten the government depending on uh, every particular case. So when the crisis brought a restriction to this kind of funding, uh, a lot of the media found themselves in difficulty. Um, as far as the new media is concerned, again, there's different cases. In the case of something like Omnia TV, for example, this was something in which Greece was poor in the past. The, in, in other countries, in Europe especially, uh, in Germany, in France, in England, there are a lot of initiatives like that. If one surfs the, the web, uh, one can find countless uh, initiatives like this that are very, very interesting and very good quality a lot of the time. In Greece, you didn't have so many things like that. Um, Radio Bubble was very successful and very popular from the beginning precisely because there wasn't that many things like that. It did it and it did it well. Omnia TV is trying to do a similar thing with uh, TV, web TV station. The other new media that you mentioned, like the editor's newspaper, like other newspapers, the Eleftherodipia that got republished, the uh, Eximere, Six Days, that got published, mm -hmm. that is a different issue. That's an issue, first, of people that were fired or basically, in, in various ways, uh, rejected by the mainstream media system that are trying to build up new structures. That's one element. But another element that we should be stressing is that Syriza that has gone to 27% needs a kind of representation in the media. The mainstream media establishment is hostile to Syriza because basically it is connected with all the interests that up to now were in government. Syriza does not have any support in the media. Now, there is a lot of people that are anticipating that at one point, if these media manage to stay open, they will get some support as Syriza consolidates its, its position. I would read the Letherotipia, for example, or Eximeres, a lot more along those lines. Not the editor's newspaper so much, because I think the situation there is more mixed. There are many different ideas. Well, so, so I think the, the situation is rather confusing. It is not a simple case of a surge of, of new media. Uh, one other question about the way Unfollow, the readership of Unfollow. Uh, you said that when you started and follow, there was no advertisement, no nothing. It just went through social media and people bought it. Is it your impression that this type of publication in Greece tends to be um, read by people who already believe what's written in it, in a sense? Isn't there a risk with all these new media, alternative media, quality media? I mean, I don't want to, to, to talk about, to negotiate the word here. It's more like, aren't the people who are listening to Radio Bubble already convinced by radio, what Radio Bubble has to say? Which would also, in a sense, be the case for Unfollow, that it's a very specific population with specific, as some political orientation towards the left, uh, a level of education. Um, and in the end, these media are perhaps not doing such a good job at reaching out to the farmer in Kozani. Uh, who does not have access to this information because he or she gets his information from Mega Channel. That's true. Um, the, the straight answer is yes, it is like this. But again, you should look into it a bit more. Uh, first of all, I'll say something risky now. Um, well-educated people are usually left-leaning and that's that. Uh, but <laughs> apart from that small observation... You can't make a magazine, you can't make anything really that is both, that, that is for everyone. That, that is also bad strategy. It's also not very true that there is an audience out there that just simply consumes high quality stuff. No. Um, you might very well be an avid reader of important literature and like very much to watch superhero movies on TV. It's allowed. 
So, again, I'm, I'm not certain that you're just uh, addressing um, things like this to a very sort of uh, highly educated, almost sort of snobbish public. On the other hand, it's true that in order to read a magazine that runs, say, 4,000 words or 5,000 word stories, uh, and uh, has coverage of rather complicated political issues, sometimes even cultural criticism, which require a level of, of proficiency in theory as well. That is quite demanding. But again, you can't, make, you can't make something for everybody. You're not making a magazine like this in order to directly influence someone who has no relation to your concerns whatsoever. You can't do that. What you can do is affect a part of the public discussion, and that's really mainly the issue here, is that the level, the quality of the public discussion in Greece is very, very low. You are trying to up the stakes a little bit, uh, feed some more uh, things into the machine and hope for the best. Okay, one last question before we go. What do you think, how successful do you think new media or alternative media have been at affecting what is being said of Greece in foreign media? Because in Radio Bubble, in a sense, I feel that we've been lucky because a lot of foreign journalists visited us. So even though I still believe that most of them have a wrong idea of Radio Bubble because some of them think that everybody here is a series of supporter, which is not, I mean, being in opposition in, in the opposition doesn't automatically mean that you're a series of supporter. No. Uh, really. But I still think that we've been lucky in a way because we have this cafe and people come and visit us. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that in general, other alternative media or new media have been able to affect to influence the agenda about Greece, to put forward. In the first years of the crisis, my feeling was that foreign journalists were coming here, they were meeting with their counterpart in Mega, and they were broadcasting basically Mega translated to a little bit better, but it was still very much affected by the mainstream media. Do you think that this has changed? I think it has changed to a degree. Uh, I also... I, I know it uh, personally because uh, some of our reporters quite often are fixers for uh, foreign journalists here. And uh, the best among the foreign journalists realized they were being fed propaganda and uh, started looking it up on their own. On the other hand, I'd, stay, I'd say efforts like uh, yours or ours and other efforts that are out there are encouraging but we should under no circumstances be complacent about it because the sheer volume that's coming the other way is just enormous. Uh, the, the, the sheer volume of the propaganda, the way they are able to, to do it is really staggering and you can't really be very pleased with yourself if you manage to have uh, a good discussion, a meaningful discussion among a few thousand people. Uh, the way these newspapers, these TV channels operate, they can make an association or create an impression. You saw it in Halkidiki in relation to demonstrations or the violence there, how they're able to taint a whole issue for weeks with this sort of skewed idea of, of violence. And it's very, very difficult to, to extricate a, a debate from, from that sort of situation. Most people continue to be informed by this type of media, and it, it takes a lot of effort to do something about that. Thank you very much. It's 3.30 in Athens, so we're going to have to leave it there because something else is coming up next. Augustine, thank you very much for coming to this show today. Thank you for having me. And I hope we can see you again in Radio Bubble. I mean, this is partly your home. <laughs> yes, that's true. Thanks. Uh, that was the RB News International show for today. We'll be back next week with more news from Greece you haven't heard about. Next up are the French and Spanish language news bulletin, and then Andidrasex in the city. From me, I read Greek. Have a nice weekend.